Good morning, everyone. Welcome to Coffee with Cade, where we're going to have a conversation, not a presentation. We have one of my favorite people on today, Dr. Rebecca Chasen from Shady Grove Fertility. Dr. Chasen is a fertility doctor, also known as a reproductive endocrinologist. And we have a topic today that I think many will find very interesting. We're going to talk about the intersection of faith and science. Often we have people from different religious backgrounds who have personal conflicts. They're, they're concerned about whether or not, first of all, infertility is being is a punishment from God, number one. And number two, they're worried about if they have fertility treatment to uh, have children if they're committing um, an act of sin or they're doing something where God would not be pleased. So one of the reasons that um, we asked Dr. Chasen to be the guest today is because she is, of course, a reproductive endocrinologist, but she's also a woman of very strong uh, faith background. And so we thought that she may be a perfect person to talk about how people from different faiths may be able to navigate this this pathway to parenthood um, and also not feel like they're abandoning the tenets of their, their faith. So without any further uh, delay, Dr. Chasen, welcome. Thank you so much. I'm really excited to be here. Um, this is certainly a topic that's near and dear to my heart. One of my favorite things to do with patients is just to work through honoring their faith and their efforts at building their family. So thanks for having me today. All right, so oftentimes I have couples come in. I think one of the real keys for people who want to honor their faith as they build their family is, first of all, to be very straightforward about where a patient is coming from. Um, I don't even know to have the conversation if someone doesn't tell me, although what's beautiful is we often pick up on it as we, as we progress through the story. Um, mm -hmm. Once I sort of know where a couple is coming from, what their faith background is, what their concerns are, perhaps why they've already decided they don't want to do IVF, then we can really have a conversation about, okay, that's great. What's the science and where do we science for family building as opposed to needing to somehow compromise faith in order to follow science? Yes. Yeah. I think one thing is sure the world does fertility treatment in a way that is most efficient and most cost effective. So sometimes efficiency and cost effectiveness have to come second as we honor faith. Um, but that's okay. There are different ways of doing things, and we just have to talk about it in order to find the best path forward for each couple. So I want to also, before uh, we get too deep into the conversation, acknowledge Dr. Chasen is a member of the Cade Foundation's Advisory Council. Yay! And he's also a Christian. So I want to kind of put that um, out there. All right, so let's get started. What is the science behind IVF and what are some of the scientific based concerns that you've heard from patients about why they are reluctant to pursue medical treatment as opposed to just continuing to wait? Um, I, I know I've heard people say, well, if I move forward with treatment, that means I don't trust God. And, um, but then when you get to a certain point, you know, you've been, you've been waiting for 10 years you're 47 years old and, you know, kind of how does that convert? How does that move forward? Sure. Um, it, the big picture of IVF is IVF is taking eggs from a female, sperm from the male, putting them together outside of the body, forming an embryo outside of the body and then putting it back into the uterus. And I think the things that I often hear are concerns. Well, first of all, are we playing God if we intervene that much? And then certainly another significant concern is what about those embryos that are created? Um, what if I have extra embryos? What does it mean to discard embryos? To so really be able to honor life and when we believe that life begins. So I think the first thing for people to understand is that IVF we, is, really uses the science that God created. We use the physiology that God created um, and certainly through that and through the use of modern medicine, bring egg and sperm together. So I do, I'm going to try to share my screen with you. Okay. All right. So one thing 
I love to share with couples, and that has really helped me as I've personally thought about this issue, is we can use medicine, modern medicine, to bring egg and sperm together. And that's really important for treating medical fertility um, diagnoses and problems. But we cannot force them to make an embryo. That there is an activation process, even if we inject one sperm directly into one egg, that activation to form an embryo still has to happen. Um, and I always tell people we have to turn off the lights and go home and come back the next day to see if an embryo has formed. So I think that's one thing I often talk to people about when we're concerned about if we're playing God, that um, there is still part of this process of the creation of an embryo that is out of our hands, um, that I think, you know, you can really see that medicine can help treat some of the diagnoses, but that this is not a process that we are somehow ordaining over and above God's will or God's design for life. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. So um, what are some of the concerns that you have heard in your practice? You've been in practice for a number of years and um, you are at Shady Grove Fertility. What are some of the things that patients have shared with you over the years other than, you know, what you've just shared about the concern that we're playing God because we're, you know, you all are putting eggs and sperm together. Um, what are some of the other issues that have been shared and how did you respond to those? So I think one other issue I hear very frequently is the concern about um, having embryos that are either discarded or can't be used. And so one thing that's very helpful, I think, is to understand the actual physiology of embryo development. And if I can get my technology to, to stick okay. with me here for a few moments, I'll pull up a slide for you all. Here we go. So this demonstrates really what happens after fertilization. So here on the upper left-hand side, this is really an egg that now has two sets of DNA in it. So that's what we're looking for that next day. We bring egg and sperm together. We perhaps even inject the sperm into egg through ICFI or intracytoplasmic sperm injection, which some of you may have heard of. We come back the next day and we're looking to see now, do we have two sets of DNA? Do we have mom and dad's DNA? So then what happens is that the embryo has to grow. And this typically happens in the fallopian tube. So egg and sperm meet in the fallopian tube, an embryo is formed in the fallopian tube, and then it takes about five days for an embryo to travel through the fallopian tube and into the uterus. And during that time, it's growing and developing. So it goes from one cell to two cells, to four cells, to eight cells. As you can see, it's exponential. And so by day three, now we've got eight cells. It's typically still in the fallopian tube. And beyond that, we start to get a more and more complicated embryo. And what we're looking for by day five or day six, when we typically put an embryo back into the uterus, is what we call a blastocyst. The embryo now has an outer ring of cells, the trophectoderm, that would go on to become the placenta and implant, and what is not very fancily named, the inner cell mass, which would go on to become the baby. And so, I think one thing that oftentimes people may not know is that some embryos that are discarded are abnormal. Not every embryo is even going to, first of all, make an embryo. Not every egg is going to make an embryo, even though it's fertilized. But certainly not every embryo is going to grow through this process normally. So I think, it, I think it's super helpful to understand embryo development because part of the time we are discarding embryos that have never formed a normal blastocyst. They either don't get to blastocyst by day five, six, or seven. We always watch all the way till day seven. That is not normal. That embryo is, is not normal. We would not anticipate that it is compatible with life. Those are often discarded. Sometimes an embryo makes a blastocyst, but it doesn't have all the parts. It might not even have an inner cell mass, or it might not even have a trophectoderm that would go on to make the placenta. So I think sometimes that's where it's helpful to understand the science, which, yeah. um, you know, as my kids are learning at their school is that is the lang language of science is really just how God created and ordered the world. And so I think sometimes it's helpful to think about it that way is that we're just getting a chance to see outside of that, the body if this embryo is developing as he designed it to develop. And I, you um, know, add a second um, while you're on that, every um, pregnancy in the womb not just outside of the body, but every time an egg and a sperm meet inside the womb, that does not result in a birth. Uh, and and maybe we can talk about that. 
Yes, I think that's very helpful to understand that sometimes these things that we're, we just we get to see, we have the privilege of seeing when we're doing IVF are also happening in vivo, in the fallopian tube, right? So sometimes you have an egg that does fertilize, but it's not a normal embryo. It partially grows and never implants. We know some embryos do implant, but aren't normal. So do not continue developing and you get that early positive pregnancy test that only lasts for a couple of days, which we call a biochemical pregnancy or unfortunately sometimes a miscarriage later on. So um, it's just an opportunity, I guess, in some ways for us to visualize this outside of the body, but it definitely mimics or you know, is, 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 is something that happens kind of in vivo all the time. We're just not always seeing it. Um, so some embryos are not normal. And so those, I think oftentimes once we understand that, feel more comfortable discarding an embryo that hasn't developed appropriately. Then that leads us to the extra embryos that have met the appropriate stage. They get to day five, six, or seven. They have made a blastocyst. Well, first of all, if there are more than one and we don't use them all immediately, we can freeze them. And we think we can freeze them indefinitely. People have had children. They have had healthy children from a frozen embryo a decade after it was originally frozen. Yes. I think the, uh, 22 years, I think the, the oldest one was, was a 22 years old. Thank you. I think it was, um, which is amazing. Yeah. So, um, you know, I think oftentimes what I hear from people though is concerned that they're gonna have way too many. Uh, one thing I, I have learned over time is that we generally don't have as many as we anticipate, that it is the rare couple that has so many embryos that they are really concerned about, you know, having a, a whole sports team at home um, or something like that. Mm -hmm there really is a lot of drop off. So even when we have normal embryos, the chance of that resulting in a live birth is still at best about 50-50. Uh -huh. It can often take multiple embryos to result in a live birth. And I, it's a complicated process. It is amazing how life forms inside the womb. So we're only watching until day five, six or seven. We put it back inside of the uterus, a lot more has to happen. And it does unfortunately not always result in a live birth. So that's one thing, is that it, it's generally speaking, we, we don't have quite as many embryos as we think we're going to have, and it may take quite a few to result in, in a live birth. Um, if a couple is finished building their family and does have extra embryos remaining, there are some wonderful options for donation, for embryo donation and adoption. And so I think there are a lot of hurdles for a family to get to the point where they really have so many extra embryos that they, they, they aren't able to use them to continue their building their family. But if they do, there are some options out there. Now, the other thing that sometimes I do is limit how many eggs we inseminate. Yes. Uh, so, okay. So one, one thing is understanding, you know, okay, how many embryos does it really take to have a child? And maybe the chance of having too many extra embryos is actually pretty low, but we can help we get to manage that. So if a woman produces 20 eggs, yes. and in particular, let's say I have a couple who really only want to have one more child, and yet they don't really want to have extra embryos. Well, maybe we won't combine all 20 eggs with sperm. That we choose to take six or 10 eggs, combine those with the sperm, and then freeze the extra eggs. That's just a cell that is not, does not have the capacity to create another human being alone without sperm. And then we, we call that limited insemination. So we just inseminate a limited number of eggs at a time. That can be more expensive for a couple than trying all of them and finding the best one right at the beginning. And so that's why I said, sometimes we end up maybe sacrificing efficiency and cost for honoring our faith. But I, I've, I've never seen anyone regret that decision, so. Unfortunately, we are gonna end this, but that doesn't mean that you can't get more information. Dr. Chasen is actually gonna be one of our uh, panelists for the upcoming Faith and Fertility Pathways to Parenthood based at the First Baptist, or in collaboration with the First Baptist Church of Glen Arden this Wednesday. And if you're seeing this after that took place, there'll be a recording of that presentation so you can get more information. And you can also just set up an appointment with her and you can schedule that. Dr. Chasen, how can people reach you if they want to follow up? Sure, well, they can reach out through the Shady Grove Fertility website through our new patient scheduling center. There's um, multiple contact points on the website or they can call the Shady Grove 
Fertility Annapolis office at 410-224-5500. I'm always happy to have this conversation. And I think having a conversation doesn't require that anything happens beyond that. Education is so helpful in making decisions. So anytime.